What are these Catholics doing that go to a mass that is in a dead language of Latin? And if you are one of those people that goes to a Latin mass, you know, and you're wondering to yourself, why are all these people not going to a Latin mass? Why are they going to mass in a language they can actually understand? Are they right or am I right? And are the other people wrong? And But we're going to get into this right now with Colin and Annie. You uh, said in our pre-show work that you've been attending a Latin mass and that you're kind of digging it. You're drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, we decided that anybody who doesn't go to the Latin Mass is going to hell. Oh my gosh. And... <laughs> no, totally joking. We, we still go to both. We go to the Novus Ordo and the Latin Mass. So Pope Paul VI, towards the end of the Second Vatican Council, after the Vatican Council, instituted this new Mass. So it's called the Novus Ordo, New Order, New Mass. So there was the Mass uh, of the Council of Trent, I think is what it was. And it's, that was in the 1500s. So it was basically the same up until the Second Vatican Council or after that. Maybe it was 1972 or something. The new mass came in, so that's the Novus Ordo. So that's in English. Uh, or the vernacular, so whatever language is in. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different. Some stuff was added, some stuff was taken out. So we actually go to a Fraternal Society of St. Peter, uh, the FSSP, and uh, they have three different parishes. They work here in Naples, Fort Myers area. And so they are a priestly order whose charism really is just teaching about the Latin Mass. So they only offer the, the Latin Mass, the old Mass, the, the Tridentine Mass, and so the Mass of the Council of Trent, which is 15-something. Uh, and another term is ad orientum. Ad orientum just means to the east. And so when you, one of the big changes is um, in the new mass, the Novus Ordo, is that the priest was facing towards you versus facing away from you. Um, now, the goal was never to face away because he hates you. It was mm -hmm. facing east. And there's this whole theology of praying to the East and uh, kind of praying with the people. Yeah. So that's one of the, the, the defining characteristics. And that is an interesting thing that's different between saying ad orientum versus Tridentine or Latin Mass. Ad orientum is just about the posture of the priest primarily, because you can have an ad orientum Mass where the priest is facing East, facing the altar away from you, yeah. that is still in English. Actually, I, I have a really beautiful memory of probably my first ad orientum Mass I ever attended, where Alina was about to give birth to to our first child. I think the day before she was due, she was in the office just saying hi to me and Father Adam Hertzfeld came up to us in my office and he's like, hey, would you like to pray the mass with me? And, and I, I would love to offer it for your labor and, and for your baby. And we were like, yeah. We went into the chapel. It was just me, Alina and Father Adam. And he did. Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. And he prayed the mass ad orientum. He had us do the liturgy of the word. We read the passages from the Bible other than the gospel, which he th then read. But it was like so intimate and so beautiful. And it's amazing to me how intimate it felt despite it being ad orientum. Because a big a big thing that people don't like the ad orientum about is that the, you're looking at the priest's back. It can feel, from from a certain lens, feel like you're, he's cut off or like it's like he's stuck up or something. Well, I can tell you that in that moment when it was the three of us, it felt intimate. It felt like the three of us were similarly focused on the Lord. Mm -hmm. It felt like it wasn't the Father Adam show. We were all pointing our gaze to the Lord. And there's so much beauty in that experience. Uh, I came away very moved by that, obviously, but there's so much beauty in like us kind of being willing to get stuff out of the way that we think is, is going to make us happier and really stripping things down to the bare bones of like, what are we really supposed to be doing here? I've actually, I've wrestled with this conflict for a long time because I've been a worship leader. Progressively throughout the years, I have wrestled more and more with what my role had been when leading music in the context of the sacred liturgy, because there were so many occasions, for example, that, you know, people would clap after a moving song or something. My heart hurts in those moments because it's like, you're clapping because A, I didn't do a terrible job. B, you were moved by the song or by the, my, my leading of it or whatever. If we understood the theology of what's actually happening at the sacred liturgy, nobody would be clapping. Yeah. No, everyone would be weeping from like sorrow over what we were accessing, but then also joy at the same time. Like I'm sure that if, if we had a true deep understanding of what it was because essentially what happens in the mass is it's like spiritual time travel like we access the power the sacrifice of the actual crucifixion at mass in the consecration like literally we're there on our knees during the consecration and it's almost as though we are transported in time and space 
to the foot of the cross, we are accessing the sacrifice of the cross in the Eucharist here and now. If we had any clue what was behind the veil that we couldn't see in that moment, we would feel the way that Mary and John felt that day, where it's a very conflicted, like, this is incredible. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. This is amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Like, I love that you guys brought this topic up because I think that we in this culture are so hungry for something that tr is transcendent, something that takes us to a higher plane of existence. And, and it cannot be more transcendent than when literally heaven kisses earth in the mass. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think I've been very disillusioned by how nonchalantly we treat the liturgy yeah. today. But yeah, so what about the Latin mass? What about it has been attracting you guys to it? There's a frustration in the church. Um, and we all experience this. I think that there's these specific ways that we are, are the church has asked us to worship that's laid out in the Vatican II documents and um, for the new mass. And there's this, all this instruction that's so beautiful. And yet there's basically not a single parish in the entire country who follows any of those to the T. So if you read the, the documents on the liturgy from Vatican II, it's almost unrecognizable what mass would look like if we just followed all of those. So there's a level of frustration. And I know that that drive drove me a little bit to think, okay, is there something are we missing something here? And and I don't think that's a good reason to go to the Latin Mass because that's like a, an issue with the church. And I think you need to kind of figure that out in obedience and humility. But on the affirmative side is where I really want to focus, saying nothing about the new Mass, saying not even having, making no criticism of it because it's not really my place to be doing that. The old is so beautiful. And so uh, like Latin, I don't know anything about Latin. It's odd. <laughs> but it takes you to a new place and it's um and the music for example i was the director of music ministry uh, at, the, at school at Ave maria university here for the last two years so i've been doing a lot of music stuff and i've actually stopped that now and the music at the latin mass so the the chant the polyphony has been amazing mm. um and just the how and touch there with the liturgy i mean for example the antiphons which some people are have never even heard before um, there's in every single mass, there's an opening antiphon, there's an offertory antiphon, there's a communion antiphon. Those are beautiful antiphons taken from the Psalms, but the average American Catholic has never heard them. Um, even though they're written into the new mass, they're just not done. Yeah. And uh, it's so cool to even get that uh, at the old mass, they have those and they're never taken out. And it's just so beautiful, but between the music, between more silence. For example, in the Latin Mass, the entire Eucharistic prayer is said completely silently. The only thing they say out loud the entire time is when he says to us also those sinners. So we just a recognition of our sin, um, which is like super powerful. And so basically it's this totally different, but also the exact same experience. And it's really helped me the same, you know, same church, same Jesus. And one of the biggest things that I like to think about is the phrase, the Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, as we pray, so we believe. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a, a parish where there's no kneelers in the church because nobody kneels for communion. We are now praying in a way that we believe. So mm. that indicates to me and to everyone else, no one takes this whole Eucharist thing seriously, okay? And that is not a judgment on anyone's beliefs there. And I'm saying on the flip side of the Latin Mass, just because they pray it well, doesn't mean they believe it well. So that's a whole, that's an internal thing. Yeah. But on the flip side, then that, that experience of, okay, the women are veiled, the, the men are in suits, we are kneeling like the whole time. There is so much silence. There is bells everywhere. There's like mm -hmm. a thousand servers, there's <laughs> incense and like all it culminates. I mean, in the elevation, it's like, whoa, maybe we actually believe this. And now it feels like we're praying in a way that we do believe. As you were talking, I just got flooded with, with the words, it is right and just for us to give him praise. That means that it's about him and it's not about us. But it, it is right and just because God is so good and has been so good to me for me to just give him everything that I am. You know, what am I looking for out of the mass? Am I looking for an experience that makes me feel good? Or am I looking for whatever way possible to just elevate the name of the Lord and to worship and praise him f for his sake? Because it is right and just, not because I deserve anything. Our number one job is to show up and worship him. Mm -hmm.